Welcome to Phase Toward Zion. For October 12th through the 18th, the Come Follow Me lesson is 3rd Nephi chapters 20 through 26. Ye are the children of the covenant. For this week's painting, I came back to one of the classical LDS painters, CCA Christensen. I used a previous painting of his for the lesson in 2nd Nephi chapters 1 through 5. I indicated that he painted the creation room in the Manti Temple. Other famous paintings by him include the handcart pioneers, the mobbing of Joseph Smith, the interior of the Carthage Jail, the crossing of the Mississippi on the ice, Joseph Smith mustering the Nauvoo Legion and others. In this painting of Christ in America, I love the little boy that is climbing the tree on the far right. I guess the little boy just wanted to see better. Also of interest are the scenes of destruction. We discussed how much time had elapsed between the time of destruction and when the Christ came. There are definitely other thoughts on that length of time. This week's lesson focuses on Christ's teachings of the second day. Chapter titles can be for 3 Nephi chapter 20, Fulfilling the Covenants, or The Role of the Covenant People. Chapter 21, Timing When the Work Will Commence, or Chiastically Reiterates the Role of the Gentile. Chapter 22, Isaiah 54, or Blessed State of the House of Israel. 3 Nephi chapter 23, Jesus Expounds the Scriptures, or The Value of the Scriptures. 3 Nephi chapter 24, Malachi chapter 3, or Preparation for the Second Coming. Chapter 25, Malachi 4, or The State of the Wicked. And finally, 3 Nephi chapter 26, Wonderful Things Accompany the Lord, or The Greater Part Not Written. In last week's lesson, we began in chapter 17 with Christ indicating the people were weak. He reviewed that it was words of Isaiah that caused their eyes to gloss over. Christ asked them to go home and ponder on those things and ask the Father that they may understand and prepare their minds for the next day. I indicated that Christ was trying to teach them to ask and they didn't catch the vision. So now, some time has passed away. Did you catch the vision? Did you go to your homes and ponder and pray on the topics that the Lord wanted to address? Have you pondered these past few weeks on the destiny of the house of Israel? Yes, Christ ended up healing and blessing the people, but he never removed his request of them to ponder and pray on those things. So now the next day came. They all gathered together and Christ appeared to them. And guess what he taught them? Yes, he went back to the topic that he, that he had asked them to ponder and pray about. He basically said that he still hadn't delivered the message he was supposed to deliver. Were they then ready to hear this message? Are you today ready to hear this message? If we aren't going to make the effort to ponder and understand, then it doesn't do us any good to review. But Christ is not going to deviate from his message. So in chapters 20 through 26, Christ comes back to this message. Ultimately, he will close this message by saying that there are greater and lesser things in the gospel. Are we willing to take the time to understand these things? If we don't understand what he has given us, how can we ask him to give us more? Unfortunately for us, these chapters are interwoven with Isaiah and Micah and Malachi, and it can be a little confusing. In order to understand how these chapters are laid out, we need to understand how the chapters break down. Sometimes this can prove challenging. Adding to the problem is that different LDS scholars will break these chapters down in different ways. How are we to understand it? I think the answer is to grasp the models that they are showing us and then read for ourselves and then take it to the Lord. He will teach you what you need to know for this time in your life. But to get to this point, you have to have a basic understanding of what is going on. I'll briefly show three different models from three different LDS scholars. I will give some of my thoughts on their strengths and limitations. Then you are left to ponder and ask the Father about these things for yourself. The first model I would like to show is that from Victor Ludlow. Dr. L Dr. Ludlow calls the, the Lord's Sermon in 3 Nephi chapters 20 and 21 the Covenant People Discourse. He maps out a very impressive chiasma. The chiasma is shown on this slide. Note at the top of the chiasma is how in chapter 20, verse 10, the father and son work together. Then the bottom of the chiasma repeats the same idea. 
the different elements all follow jointly. At the center of the chiasm is 3 Nephi chapter 21, verse 4, the sign of the covenant. For Dr. Ludlow, this section is about covenants and signs. In the book, Rediscovering the Book of Mormon, Dr. Ludlow notes that the sign starts with the Book of Mormon. Ultimately, he concludes that the acceptance of the Latin people is the fulfilling the sign that the covenant people are returning. The second model I would like to review is that of Joe Spencer. You can find this on the Feast Upon the Word blog. Dr. Spencer lays chapters 20 and 21 into nine sections. These are the introduction, which includes verses 10 through 14. Then the next six verses, 15 through 21, cover what is found in Micah, chapter 5, verses 7 to 9, and chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. This material is about Israel and the Gentiles. The third section, verses 22 through 28, discuss the role of the prophets, Moses, Abraham, and others. Then come some sections where Christ weaves in different verses of Isaiah. The seventh section ties in Isaiah with Micah. He concludes with the Gentiles and the covenant wrapping up with Isaiah. I like how Isaiah and the words of Micah are prominent in this analysis. The third analysis I'd like to mention is by Avraham Gileadi in his book, The Last Days, Types and Shadows from the Bible and the Book of Mormon. Dr. Gileadi breaks this up into two different discourses, each with a different chiasmus. The first discourse covers chapter 20 and covers what happens to the house of Israel. At the center of the discourse are the words of Christ. The first discourse focuses on the Gentiles, some will hear the Lord's words, but most do not. However, the house of Israel seems to react differently. They believe and establish the New Jerusalem. Dr. Gileadi's second discourse then covers chapter 21. This discourse emphasizes what happens to the Gentiles. The second discourse has the same number of elements as the first, with the climax of the chiasma coming at the eighth level, or level H. The focus is on the great and marvelous work. Both discourses cover the role of the Gentiles and the house of Israel. I wanted to show these three different ways to understand these chapters for many reasons. Really, we should settle in and spend about an hour on each analysis, even studying what these authors had to say. This would allow us to better understand the different parts of the sermon. One reason I wanted to show these different ways of looking at this is to show that this way of studying, or may I use the word exegesis, can lead to different conclusions. Even breaking chapters into chiastic structures is not cut and dried. It is as much an art as it is a science. And since it's an art, often you will find what you are looking to find. If you have an agenda, you will be able to read it into the analysis. But if you study the same material at different times in your life, you may also come up with different conclusions. Your needs at this time of your life are different than the needs at other times in your life. This allows you to learn the same verses in different ways. There's not always a right way and a wrong way to look at these verses. There are generally multiple right ways to look at things. Some of my thoughts on what they have to say are that while their analyses of chapters 20 and 21 are very good, they generally stop with chapter 21, and yet Christ's sermon goes through chapter 26. Chapter 22 covers Isaiah chapter 54. Chapter 23 covers the role of Samuel the Lamanite, who was a contemporary with many of the people that were then present. This is really the story of modern revelation. Prophecies that are contemporary, contemporary are as important or perhaps even more so than ancient prophecy. Chapters 24 and 25 covers Malachi chapters 3 and 4. None of the above authors tick and tie what Malachi had to say and how it ties off Isaiah and Micah. And then, 3 Nephi chapter 26, again we should spend a couple of hours trying to understand what are the lesser and the greater parts of the gospel. I have seen these defined in different ways at different times. This is really an important part of the Book of Mormon, and usually, by the time we get to these 
chapters in, in our lessons, we are out of time and so we often seem to skip it. I only wish I had the time to cover all of this. I really like how Dr. Spencer ties in Isaiah with Micah. And if you read what he wrote, he ties Micah, a contemporary of Isaiah, not with 1st Isaiah, but with 2nd Isaiah. Biblical scholars all divide Isaiah up into three sections, and they say they were written by three different authors at three different times. This Book of Mormon inclusions invalidates much of that theory. However, 3rd Nephi is never mentioned in the Book of Mormon. You can almost conclude that this part may really have been written by a different author at a later date. Let's just point out a few interesting things. In 3rd Nephi chapter 20, Christ starts off his lecture the second day referencing that this is what he started talking about the previous day. We should look at all of chapter 16 for an intro into the Lord's teachings on the second day. In verse 13, he scopes his remarks to all of the remnants. Remember who are the remnants? The lost ten tribes, the Jews, the Lamanites, and others we may not know not of. In verse 14, he defines again that the land of inheritance for the descendants of Lehi is this land, the Western Hemisphere. Christ reiterates the point from chapter 16, verse 16. The Nephites may have missed that the first day. Christ wants to reiterate that. He will later talk about the different remnants returning to the lands of their inheritance. He wants to ensure the Nephites that they understand their role. Verse 15 clearly defines the Gentiles that don't repent will be the recipient of these prophecies. Then he paraphrases Micah chapter 5 verses 8 through 9. I put these references side by side so you can compare them. You can see how Christ applies these prophecies to them. It is not a direct quote, but an application of the prophecy. Micah says, And the remnant of Jacob shall be among the Gentiles, in the midst of many people, as a lion among the beasts of the forest, as a young lion among the flocks of sheep, who, if he goes through, both treadeth down and teareth in pieces, and none can deliver. Thine hand shall be lifted up upon thine adversaries, and all thine enemies shall be cut off. Third Nephi applies these verses by saying, Then shall ye, who are a remnant of the house of Israel, go forth among them, and ye shall be in the midst of them who shall be many, and ye shall be among them as a lion among the beasts of the forest, and as a young lion among the flocks of the sheep, who, if he goeth through, both treadeth down, and teareth in pieces, and none can deliver. He directly quotes, Thy hand shall be lifted up upon thine adversaries, and thine enemies shall be cut off. I highlighted the similarities. You can see how the Lamanites, who are the remnant of the house of Jacob through Lehi, will go through the sheep or the unrepentant Gentiles that Christ references in verse 15 as a lion who goes through the sheep. Basically, the lion can do anything he wants, and the sheep have no power whatsoever. Thy hand shall be lifted up upon thine adversaries, and all thine enemies shall be cut off. This doesn't sound like it works out very well for the Gentiles who don't repent. Remember, the Gentiles who repent will be numbered with the remnant. So we will go through the unrepentant Americans and we'll cut them off. Now you, now, you can see why Joseph Smith would be charged with treason. You can see why people would say, Oh, you think you are all that? Well, we will show you who will tread down who. But sorry, this is all just biblical. Continuing the next verses, verses 18 through 19, they mirror Micah chapter 4, verses 12 through 13. I will read the third Nephi verses. Compare the highlighted verses with Micah on the right. And I will gather my people together as a man gathers his sheaves into the floor. For I will make my people with whom the Father hath covenanted, yea, I will make thy horn iron, and I will make thy hoofs brass. And thou shalt beat in pieces many people, and I will consecrate their gain unto the Lord, and their substance unto the Lord of the whole earth. And behold, I am he who doeth it. 
One significant addition here is when the Lord says, I am he who doeth it. Remember back in 3 Nephi chapter 9, I pointed out that Christ was adamant in chapter 9 that the people knew it was Christ who had made all that destruction. Remember I pointed out that in chapter 9 the word I was given 30 times in 22 verses. Christ wanted the people then to know that he had done those things. Those things didn't happen because of global warming due to poor environmental laws. He didn't want there to be any excuses or people to explain this away with science. Now, that is not saying there is not a role in science as there is, but the destructions that will come will be because of Christ, not global warning. warming. Here in verse 19, it is clear that these verses will happen because Christ does this. Nothing else will be able to explain away all these things. Christ is the one who did this, and everyone will then know that. And this leads into something that is very powerful. 3 Nephi chapter 20, verses 20 through 22. And it shall come to pass, saith the Father, that the sword of my justice shall hang over them at that day. And except they repent, it shall fall upon them, saith the Father, yea, even upon all the nations of the Gentiles. And it shall come to pass that I will establish my people, O house of Israel. And behold, this people will I establish in this land, according to the fulfilling of the covenant which I made with your father Jacob. And it shall be a new Jerusalem, and the powers of heaven shall be in the midst of this people, yea, even I will be in the midst of you. From a strict, strictly exegetical standpoint, this is fascinating. First off, Christ is quoting the Father directly. If you look for a verse in any scripture that says something like, And the Father said it shall come to pass that the sword of justice shall hang over them at that day, if you look for that verse, you won't find it. Christ has received this information directly from the Father, and he is now saying it. If you would like to find if you could find a verse like that in the Old Testament or the New Testament where the Father is talking directly, wouldn't you be excited? Well, it's not there, but it is here in 3 Nephi. For me, the point of interest is when he uses the phrase that day, when is that day? That day when the sword of justice will hang over the heads of the Gentiles, even all the nations of the Gentiles. I think if that day is not today, then we're pretty close. I personally think that today is that day. If you look at our society today, are there any trends that do not follow God's teachings? Just open any of the news channels. Today is the day that Gentiles need to repent. And who is there that can call the Gentiles to repent? I guess that really falls on us, on you and on me. President Nelson's recent Sunday morning talk in General Conference addressed this topic. He said we do this through missionary work, temple work, and family history work. That is how we partake in this work, missionary, temple, and family history work. I will speak more about this when I wrap up the lesson, but let's move on. Then it says, And it shall come to pass that I will establish my people, O house of Israel, and behold, this people will I establish in this land unto the fulfilling of the covenant which I made with your father Jacob, and it shall be in New Jerusalem. And the powers of heaven shall be in the midst of this people, yea, even I will be in the midst of you. It's important to the Lord to have a people defined, to know where each of us are in relation with him. And he clearly defines that the Lamanites and the repentant Gentiles that live here, that that this is their land of inheritance. The reference to Jacob here is Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham. It's interesting that he references the covenant with Jacob and not with the covenant he made with his grandfather Abraham. The covenant with Jacob is the fulfilling of the 12 tribes. The fact that each son received a different blessing. Joseph is a fruitful bough, even whose branches run over the wall. It's through this covenant that we will receive this land, and it's here that the new Jerusalem will be built. This concept of the new Jerusalem influenced the pilgrims and the pioneers. The destiny of America is the new Jerusalem, and the powers of heaven shall be in the midst of this people. Yea, even I will be in the midst of you. 
So Christ himself will rule over the new Jerusalem. How would you like to be part of this new Jerusalem? What do you have to do to be part of this new Jerusalem? Interestingly, the answer is it's missionary work, temple work, and family history work. And with that, Christ then delves into a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up. This is Moses speaking in Deuteronomy chapter 18. Christ then says that it is he of whom all the other prophets testified. Christ earlier spoke of the new Jerusalem, which will be established in this land. But then he speaks of other inheritances. And I will remember the covenant which I made with my people, and I have covenanted with them that I would gather them together in mine own due time, that I would give unto them again the land of their fathers for their inheritance which is the land of Jerusalem, which is the promised land unto them forever, saith the Father. They, the other children of Jacob, also have a promised land, but their promised land is the land of Jerusalem, and that center will also be established. Then shall their watchmen lift up their voice, and with the voice together shall they sing, for they shall see eye to eye. Then will the Father gather them together again, and give unto them Jerusalem for the land of their inheritance. Then shall they break forth into joy. Sing together, ye waste places of Jerusalem, for the Father hath comforted his people. He hath redeemed Jerusalem. The Father hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of the Father, and the Father and I are one. And where have we ever heard these verses before? This is Isaiah chapter 52, verses 8 through 10, which were the verses quoted in chapter 16 that started this all off. The Lord has given additional information to these verses. From here, he will back up and paraphrase this, the first seven verses from Isaiah 52, but not in the same order. And then he will paraphrase the rest of Isaiah 52. He will close out the chiasmus in chapter 21, and then in chapter 22, he'll quote Isaiah chapter 54, then Malachi chapters 3 and 4. If you can understand all of this, then you have a good foundation of the destiny of the house of Israel, that God will remember his people. And what does it mean that the Father hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all nations? My thoughts are that throughout history, God's arm has been covered. It's like his arm has a sleeve on it. To see his arm, you have to live through faith. You have to be able to see when he interacts with you and understand his works. You have to have faith on his prophets. But there will come a time when his sleeve is removed and you will see his arm. His prophets will declare themselves and you no longer have to wonder if they are really God's servants. He will do these things and you will know that it, he is the author of that work. There won't be any guesswork. Your faith will be fulfilled when you get to that point. The Father hath made bare his holy arm. Here, think about the temple. This is addressed very clearly there, but you have to understand what is happening. And hint, it happens in the telestial room. I wish I had time to go through each verse in the remaining chapters or even each chapter, but I will only be able to give a few highlights. Third Nephi chapter 22 verses 1 through 2 Compare this to Isaiah 54, 1 through 2. And then shall that which is written come to pass. Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, thou that, that didst not travail with child. For more are the, are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. Enlarge the place of thy tent, and let them stretch forth the curtains of thy habitations. Spare not. Lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes. There's really a lot in these two verses. You first have to define who is Isaiah referring to when he refers to the children of the desolate and the children of the married wife. What this refers to is the marriage of Christ to the church. Initially, Christ made a marriage covenant with ancient Israel, except they were not faithful. They did not bring forth good works. Good works is symbolic with having children. So Israel did not bear any good works, so they are barren. But the day will come when they will remember their covenants. In that day they will sing. So, sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear. This means that the house of Israel will one day be gathered 
and they will be able to break forth into singing and cry out aloud, Thou that didst not travail with child. Once Israel was unfaithful, then God extended the covenant to the Gentiles. But the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. So the Gentiles then became the married wife. What this verse is saying is that when the house of Israel returns, when the ten tribes start to come back and Jerusalem is reestablished, that there will be more of the returning house of Israel than there are of the faithful Gentiles, that's us, that remain. So when they return, there will be more children of the desolate or of the bloodline of the house of Israel that did never bear fruit than the children of the married wife. Here the, married, here the faithful Gentiles are the married wife, and there won't be many that are left in relation to the number of the children of Israel. So let's read it one more time. Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. Then comes verse 2. Enlarge the place of thy tent, and let them stretch forth the curtains of thy habitations. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes. Of course, Isaiah has many interpretations, and we are tempted to say that we need to build more stake centers, which is strengthening thy stakes. But I don't think that is what Isaiah means in this instance. Remember the story of Abraham, Abraham how he wandered through Canaan. Remember the 40 years when Israel with Moses wandered in the wilderness. So when a man married, he would give his wife a tent that was just large enough for the two of them. But as children came, they would make additional flaps for the tent and then add more stakes to secure it. When Isaiah talks about the curtains of thy habitations, the habitations is referring to the family. Remember, the family is the eternal unit. Eternal things are made in the temple and it's families that are established in the temples. So when we enlarge the place of thy tent, we are making room for additional members to come into our family. When the children of Israel return to the fold, we, the children of the married wife, have to make room for them to come into the family of Christ. We have to enlarge the place of thy tent and let them stretch forth the curtains of thy habitations. Spare not, lengthen thy cords and strengthen thy stakes. It's saying, don't be jealous of all these new people, but instead welcome them and make room for them. This verse and theme is in multiple places throughout the scriptures. You will need to create links to these additional verses in, to the, in your electronic scriptures. For 3 Nephi 22 and 2, link the following. Isaiah 54, 1 through 2. Hebrews 11, 8 through 10. Doctrine and Covenants 82, 13 through 14. Doctrine and Covenants 133, 9. And Moroni chapter 10, verses 30 and 31. Each of the verses in these links should be studied, but let's talk quickly about Moroni chapter 10, verses 30 and 31. You may recognize Moroni chapter 10 as the last chapter in the Book of Mormon. Here, Moroni is writing his last words, the one thing that he wants to leave with us. So the last thing he wants us to remember is, and again, I would exhort you that you would come unto Christ and lay hold upon every good gift and touch not the evil gift nor the unclean thing. <clears throat> and awake, and arise from the dust, O Jerusalem, yea, and put on thy beautiful garments, O daughter of Zion, and strengthen thy stakes, and enlarge thy borders forever, that thou mayest no more be confounded, that the covenants of the Eternal Father, which he hath made unto thee, O house of Israel, may be fulfilled. Of course, here he is paraphrasing. This be begins with the phrase, Come unto Christ. Remember when we talked about the Beatitudes, we discussed, Yea, blessed are the poor in spirit, who come unto me. Here, the me is Christ. So he is saying we have to come unto Christ. Here, Moroni just comes out and says that. We talked about what it means to come unto Christ. Then when he says, Awake and arise, put on thy beautiful garments. This is paraphrasing Isaiah 52, which is 3 Nephi chapter 20, verse 36. And then is the part that he says to strengthen thy stakes and enlarge thy borders forever. Moroni here is referring to this restoration of the house of Israel, but he is also applying this to us individually today. Today we strengthen our stakes and we enlarge our borders 
by strengthening our families through Come Follow Me and other methods. We also do this through missionary work, temple work, and family history work. And this, I think, is the message that President Nelson wanted to leave with us in last week's general conference. After Jesus quotes Isaiah, he then quotes Malachi. Now remember that Malachi was not written until approximately 200 years until after Lehi left Jerusalem, so the Nephi people would not have these scriptures. Jesus is teaching them about the end times. When the angel Moroni appeared to Joseph Smith, he first introduced himself and told Joseph about the plates and the Urim and Thummim. Then he quoted a number of scriptures. <clears throat> the first scriptures that Joseph relates are those in Malachi. After telling me these things, he commenced quoting the prophecies of the Old Testament. He first quoted part of the third chapter of Malachi, and he quoted also the fourth or last chapter of the same prophecy, though with a little variation from the way it reads in our Bibles. Instead of quoting the first verse as it reads in our book, he quoted it thus, For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall burn as stubble. For they that come shall burn them, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. And again he quoted the fifth verse thus, Behold, I will reveal unto you the priesthood by the hand of, the, of Elijah the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. He also quoted the next verse differently, and he shall plant in the hearts of the children the promises made to the fathers, and the hearts of the children shall turn to their fathers. If it were not so, the whole earth would be utterly wasted at his coming. In addition to these, he quoted the eleventh chapter of Isaiah, saying that it was about to be fulfilled. So, whenever discussions are held on the last days, these verses of Malachi should be studied. You should spend quite a bit of time with these for your personal study. Christ then taught many things, and it even says, And he did expound all things, even from the beginning until the time that he should come in his glory. Yea, even all things which should come upon the face of the earth, even until the elements should melt with fervent heat, and the earth should be wrapped together as a scroll, and the heavens and the earth should pass away. When Christ expounded all things from the beginning until the end that he should come in his glory, I would say that this understanding would be considered a temple text. That is really what is taught in the temple, all things, even from the beginning until the time that he should come in his glory. Then Mormon says that he could not write even a hundredth part of what Jesus taught, but the plates of Nephi contained more of what was taught. Then Mormon says, And these things have I written, which are a lesser part of the things which he taught the people, and I have written them to the intent that they may be brought again unto this people from the Gentiles according to the words which Jesus hath spoken. And when they shall re and when they have received this, which it is expedient that they should have first, to try their faith, and if it so be that they shall believe these things, then shall the greater things be ma made manifest unto them. And if it so be that they will not believe these things, then shall the greater things be withheld from them unto their condemnation. Here I highlighted the phrase of the lesser part and the greater things. What is meant by the lesser part and the greater things? I have heard these phrases defined in different ways. Since all that is written is the lesser part, then some have said that the greater things are what is taught in the temple. It is there in the temple where these things, these greater things are taught. We should go to the temple and learn of these greater things there. Now, however, I have also heard these phrases, the lesser part and the greater things, defined in other ways. Some have taught that the greater things are things that can only be taught through personal revelation. While the scriptures teach us principles through the stories of others, only God himself can teach you personal things. Things such as who you were in pre-mortality things you personally were foreordained to do. What should you accomplish in this life, and what and who should you personally minister to? I believe that some phrases, even the lesser part and the greater things, God does not give us cut and dried definitions. These phrases and symbols are like onions and they have layers, 
As I taught earlier in this lesson, at different times in our lives, we need to learn different things. Hopefully, we are still growing and we can understand more after we learn even more. And so it is with learning the greater things. Hopefully, you have learned some of these greater things in the temple. Hopefully, you have learned about yourself through personal introspection and personal revelation. In his Sunday morning address, President Nelson talked about the theme of the restoration of the House of Israel. His message was that we are still in the process of completing this restoration. The restoration is not complete yet. He taught that the premillennial gathering is also an individual saga. The idea here, I think, is we can't do anything about the future, but we can do things here in the present. We should focus on what we can impact, and that is today. Let's listen to his words and remember that this is the prophet speaking. My dear brothers and sisters, how grateful I am for this marvelous, for the marvelous messages of this conference and for my privilege to speak with you now. For the more than 36 years, I've been an apostle. The doctrine of the gathering of Israel has captured my attention. Everything about it has intrigued me, including the ministries and names of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, their lives and their wives, the covenant God made with them and extended through their lineage, the dispersion of the 12 tribes, and the numerous prophecies about the gathering in our day. I have studied the gathering prayed about it, feasted upon every related scripture, and asked the Lord to increase my understanding. For centuries, prophets have foretold this gathering, and it is happening right now. As an essential prelude to the second coming of the Lord, it is the most important work in the world. This premillennial gathering is an individual saga of expanding faith and spiritual courage for millions of people. And as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints or Latter-day Covenant Israel, we have been charged to assist the Lord with this pivotal work. When we speak of gathering Israel on both sides of the veil, we are referring, of course, to missionary, temple, and family history work. We are also referring to building faith and testimony in the hearts of those with whom we live, work, and serve. Any time we do anything that helps anyone on either side of the veil to make and keep their covenants with God, we are helping to gather Israel. To help gather Israel. Now, how does the Lord feel about people who will let God prevail? Nephi summed it up well. The Lord loveth those who will have him to be their God. Behold, he loved our fathers and he covenanted with them. Yea, even Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he remembers the covenants which he has made. Close quote. And what is the Lord willing to do for Israel? The Lord has pledged that he will fight our battles and our children's battles and our children's children's battles to the third and fourth generation. As you study your scriptures during the next six months, I encourage you to make a list of all that the Lord has promised he will do for covenant Israel. I think you will be astounded. Ponder these promises. Talk about them with your family and friends. 
then live and watch for these promises to be fulfilled in your own life. My dear brothers and sisters, as you choose to let God prevail in your lives, you will experience for yourselves that our God is a God of miracles. As a people, we are his covenant children, and we will be called by his name. Of this I testify in the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Amen.